Uh, it's my honor to be here and uh, thanks uh, the Jockey Club. So this is my first time, I need to confess, this is my first time joining the, uh, attending the non-academic conference, so I'm a little bit nervous because I don't know whether my material will be a little bit uh, too, um, too difficult to digest, but I'll try my best to explain uh, in plain language and uh, connect it, them to the practical practices. Um, so uh, actually, I started my disaster journey or my disaster track um, back in the, to the time when I was a PhD student at the Rutgers University in the U.S. So uh, I started working on the disaster like a Hurricane Katri uh, Katrina, and then when I graduated, uh, um, a disaster, uh, Hurricane Sandy happened. So uh, at that time, I mostly focusing on how organizations, um, especially those organizations who uh, were affected by the disaster, how they recovered uh, using their social networks and get their so social capital to recover after the disaster. So five years ago, I came back to Asia and I started noticing that uh, actually Asia is the most vulnerable continent for floods and storms. As we can see, the increasing incidence of different type of natural disasters in the past uh, decade. And, uh, but the burden was not shared equally, especially for Asia is always the most vulnerable continent in terms of the impact and uh, the casualties. So uh, in the past uh, six years, uh, or probably say the uh, past three years, I'm focusing on the uh, disaster topics in the Asian Pacific uh, context. So I kind of break down my research areas into three uh, big circles. So the first one is uh, I'm focusing on how organizations, uh, they use their networks uh, to respond uh, to disasters, uh, especially with the use of social, uh, social media and other mobile technologies. So uh, the example will be actually the three uh, cases I will be talking about today. And then the, the second circle will be the use of uh, technology uh, for humanitarian organizations and the public organizations. Uh, they use these technologies to communicate uh, disaster-related uh, topics to the public and also to other entities. So how they use technology to communicate with each other and uh, coordinate, co collaborate with each other. The third circle will be how individuals, the publics, how they use uh, social uh, media and mobile technologies and uh, tap into their social networks to respond to different type of disasters and engage in the long-term disaster risk reduction measures. And uh, all um, around, uh, common to these three circles um, uh, is the, the application of a social network lens. So I will talk about what a social network means and how it's related to the, the resilience. So for today's topic, I want to kind of give you some background uh, about what social network is and how it relates to the disaster resilience. And uh, specif specifically, I will talk about three uh, cases that I conducted in the past five years and to illustrate how resilience could be in enacted in uh, interorganizational networks in disasters. So what is network? I don't know how much uh, you kind of uh, know about this social network concept. But basically, it's just a set of uh, ties linking pairs of uh, the uh, linking pairs of nodes of the same type. So on the left, um, this is actually I don't know whether anyone can guess what is this the network about. Can anyone? Uh, yeah, the nodes are the countries. So the links are the trade uh, relationships. So this is actually the international trade network. And on the right side, these are the characters in a novel. So basically, they are just the, how those characters uh, in the novel, uh, they have different types of relationships in the novel, portrayed in the novel. So in the, uh, in the class, I actually teach uh, students um, that them to practice when they watch the Game of Thrones or the uh, uh, different, like uh, the, the man-man, how the relationships are um, built and maintained between different type of uh, act, uh, actresses or actors. So these are uh, social networks. This could be different type of uh, nodes and relationships. So the nodes could be, uh, each node could represent persons, families, group organizations, countries, even words. So recently I started doing semantic network analysis. Uh, I look at how those humanitarian organizations, when they post their messages on social media, uh, how they, uh, tend to use different words to frame their uh, messages. So these are the semantic network. So the different uh, nodes are words. And could be the hyperlink uh, networks. So each node refer to different websites. So these uh, uh, nodes uh, could 
in any context, uh, whenever you want to apply, you could construct a network to see, kind of have a bird's eye view of the structure, how the structure shape the behaviors of individual uh, nodes. So the relationship could be different types of, uh, you name it, uh, kinship, uh, trust relationships, or in today's context could be the collaboration, uh, collaborative relationships, or just uh, giving information volunteers. This could be different types of relationships. So uh, what is social network analysis? So why is it so hard today? Uh, well, it, I kind of narrowed it down into like two points. Why is social network analysis so hard? So the first one is that it provides answers to explaining regularities of human societies. So because my area is uh, focusing on organizational communication, so I use social network analysis to help me provide the answer in terms of why certain organizations with a similar trace, uh, why do they tend to become partners? Or why two people facing different situations they end up having the similar behaviors? So this is about the structural influence. So when they are in the same network, they tend to have some social influence. Um, so their behaviors will end up being the same or similar. And the second point would be that uh, social network analysis could provide answers to explaining variations across uh, groups or, uh, or contexts or account for differences in outcomes. So why two project teams, even though they are involved in the same task, why they end up the, uh, the negotiating, uh, having a different deals uh, within the same clients because of their relationships with the clients because of their relationships internally uh, to the group or to the organizations. So using social net analysis could provide us uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, answers to these two uh, different situations. So in disaster risk reduction, a social network uh, analysis uh, lens could explain why certain individuals respond and recover faster than others in the same community. So it's ties to the social networks that individuals have. So when a disaster happens, some individuals, they probably have the social uh, strong ties within the community, or they have some weak ties outside of the community. So when a disaster happens, they know where to get the resources, and they know uh, the correct information uh, and, um, in the first place. So this social network analysis could explain the variations um, between individuals in terms of the um, the way they respond and recover. And then it could also explain why certain communities respond and recover differently than other communities. So again, it's related to the structures, uh, network structure, um, I mean the networks among the community organizations or the organization outside of the communities. So uh, in, um, in the next um, few slides, I'll be talking about the different type of network structures in different communities that kind of explain uh, their uh, recovery and rebuilding after uh, disasters. So why certain organizations could respond differently to different type of disasters? So again, it could be related to uh, certain organizations that have the stakeholders uh, they, uh, they're uh, spread out, uh, spread um, in different areas. So when a disaster happens, they know where to get the resources. They know where to uh, get uh, um, to uh, give resources, um, being connected to the organizations uh, on the ground. And so, lastly, um, social network analysis could explain why certain organizations get differently out of different relief efforts. So during a disaster, um, a relief organization, they might uh, some organization might uh, choose to stay. Uh, some organization might choose to just uh, um, um, pull out uh, right after the disaster ends. But for those organizations who stay, they might be able to actually build their latent ties, their networks. So when the next disaster happens, uh, they could reactivate these ties uh, to get involved uh, in another uh, disaster. So this could uh, um, come in, help us to understand what to prepare for the for the next disaster. So um, so. Um, from the past few years, I come up with the idea of uh, activated network resilience. So this is kind of the concept that uh, refers to the capacity of a network of organizations to join response actions in a structure, yet uh, also very flexible and adaptable way that helps the affected uh, communities to respond to disasters. So this activity network resilience could be uh, seen as the process of networks or could be as the, uh, the outcome of networks. So in the, in the next, I'm going to use uh, three cases to explain what this activated network resilience, uh, resilience refers to. Uh, so the first two cases will be uh, about uh, to illustrate the process of uh, 
uh, how resilience is the process of networks. And the, the last case will be, um, il be to illustrate uh, uh, resilience as the outcome of networks. So uh, we know that um, um, I need to kind of take a, a step back to explain the, uh, the resilience, um, the, the, the foundation or the reference that uh, I draw on. So in organizational area, uh, resilience could be defined um, uh, in four dimensions, redundancy, resourcefulness, robustness, robustness and uh, uh, rapidity. I kind of uh, um, wide out the uh, rapidity because uh, in the past I couldn't really measure this uh, dimension, so I kind of focusing on the, the other three. So redundancy, what is redundancy? Redundancy means that organization could provide substitute, sub substitute uh, resources to affected uh, um, communities or uh, affected entities. So they could provide different types of resources to the affected uh, entities, so, so this is redundancy. Resourcefulness means that uh, organizations could uh, um, per, uh, could um, operate, uh, could deal with the, the impact and disruption with uh, plans and resources. So usually this uh, could refer that uh, could refer to the situation where they have a diverse composition of the members, so they can pull in different types of resources. So that's the dimension of resourcefulness. And robustness means that um, the organization has the uh, uh, continued ability of uh, maintaining or, or carrying out the designated functions, so that's robustness. So uh, in the, uh, the concept of actively network resilience could be manifested in different dimensions of resilience. So uh, that would be the case where uh, the, the network of or, or response organizations, when they are uh, activated, they will provide different types of resources uh, or different types of resource networks to the affected communities. And they will uh, fit, they will, uh, when they activate this resource response network, they will fit the disaster context where it uh, is actually appropriate. And then they will, because of when they activate this response network, they need to consider the stability and the flexibility. So they usually will include a diverse composition of members. Some are new, some are the first timers, and some are returning uh, um, actors, pl returning players. So this diverse composition will increase uh, the adaptation uh, and the stability of these response networks. So uh, through these uh, different dimensions of uh, res uh, re um, resilience, so the network uh, is activated, uh, they will help kind of help this uh, uh, res response network to carry out, uh, carry out their task from one disaster to the next. So that's what I mean by uh, activated network resilience. So they could be activated whenever there's a disaster happens. So the question I want to kind of answer through my research is that how do humanitarian relief networks exhibit resilience in different type of disasters? So focusing on these uh, different dimensions. So the cases that I uh, um, research, uh, they are actually four disasters, and they could uh, be divided into two types of disasters. So uh, two uh, disasters are earthquakes. Uh, one uh, is in Nepal, and the other is Ecuador. And the, the other two are cyclone, Benawadu cyclone and Fiji cyclone. They happen in, uh, within a one year's uh, uh, time frame. So uh, you can see on the left, these are the, all the relief net, uh, networks uh, for cyclones. So uh, uh, in, uh, in a minute, I'll kind of zoom in to let you know, uh, kind of see the clear picture of the nodes. But you can see the structure of kind of different. So on the, on the top, they are the relief networks for cyclones. And on the bottom, these are the relief networks for earthquakes. So for the cyclones, they have, uh, even within each cyclone, they have two types of networks. As I mentioned, I want to look at the redundancy. So they, uh, how they engage in different types of networks to help the affected communities. So even within cyclo a cyclone, the two types of networks exhibit uh, different structures. And then for the earthquakes, um, these are the kind of bigger uh, clusters without any segregation. So these are the, uh, the earthquake, earthquake type of uh, network. And then the bottom is the Ecuador. So you can see Ecuador is kind of different from the other three disasters. So for the um, Venawatu cyclone, you can see on the, on the left, 
These are called the, I call the co-located networks. So the, each node is a humanitarian organization. So with the links are that the, the, uh, they activate these links when they provide services in the same location. So that's why I call the co-located network. So on the right, these are called the co-cluster network. So each node, again, uh, is the humanitarian organization. But the links are created when they provide a similar service type. So I call it co-cluster network. So you can see on the on the left on the left co 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 located network it's kind of big cluster. There are no specific, uh, particular uh, like stars or isolate. Uh, so but on the right you can see there's segregation into different type of clusters. So you can see on the left it kind of give you more like a new organization, new players, an opportunity to enter, to join the network. But on the right, there is a more priori uh, bureaucratic structure that kind of prevents a uh, new organization because when they join, they don't really know where they belong. Uh, so this, the right uh, is more top-down bureaucratic structure. So that's even within um, each disaster, you can see two different types of networks. And uh, for the next Nepal earthquake, so it's a very big cluster. Also, by the way, for the Nepal earthquake, the organization, the sample size is 400 and 405 organizations. So you can see a big cluster. And uh, even on the right, you can, you can separate into just two clusters, not unlike the previous one. There are several clusters. So for the Nepal earthquake, they, they are at the most two clusters. So what does that mean? That means that for earthquake, these type of disasters, organizations could more, they could have a higher chance to join uh, the existing networks. So the, uh, the threshold is lower. So that's uh, what this uh, two cluster means. But for the Ecuador earthquake, it's kind of loosely connected network. You don't really see uh, 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 like a segregation of clusters. So I will ex kind of provide my explanation in terms of the unique situation in Ecuador, why is it different from the other three disasters? So for the, uh, let's break down into the three dimensions that I mentioned earlier, how these uh, different networks exhibit a resilience uh, in, in three dimensions. For, for the redundancy, I see for the Vanuatu and the VG cyclones. So these cyclone disasters, organizations, if they occupy the central position, they will maintain the central position in different types of networks. What does that mean? That means that if they are central in one network, they will be central in another network. Uh, by the same token, if they are disadvantaged, if they are not central in one network, they will be not central player in the other network. So this kind of uh, inequality is reinforced in these type of disasters. But for the Nepal earthquake and Ecuador earthquake, the networks are more fluid, so it can go beyond existing clusters. So if the central organization, uh, if they are central in one network, they are not necessarily central in the other, in the other network. So they give you more flexibility and uh, opportunity to join uh, the disaster relief for this type of uh, um, disasters. So that, uh, this for the dimension of redundancy, so we can see in different types of uh, networks, uh, the, the structures are different. And for the next dimension called robustness, because I define uh, robustness uh, as the, the capacity of organizations to really join, uh, to activate their response efforts whenever it fits the local disaster context. So I see in the dimension of robustness, organizations of different types, uh, they tend to um, um, join a particular type of network. And for the Fiji cyclone organization from the same regions are more likely to join a particular type of network. So you can see uh, in these three different disasters, so organization, the way they join networks are kind of uh, motivated by different reasons. So for the uh, Vanuatu and Nepal earthquake, um, if they are of different types, if they are the NGOs and private organizations, they are likely to join a particular type of network. But for the Fiji cyclone, if you are from the same region, like from the uh, from the Asia or from the Pacific region or from the or North America region, they are likely to join a particular type of network. So you can see in different disasters, uh, the way the organization join uh, are different. So that shows the robustness because uh, you can find kind of uh, find a way to fit the local context. And the last one is called the resourcefulness. So you can see the Vanuatu and Nepal earthquake, uh, the organizations, their prior experience will uh, kind of motivate them to join the uh, new disaster uh, re relief actions. So for the Vanuatu and the Nepal earthquake, we see uh, 
organizations prior experience are kind of uh, important. But for the Fiji cyclone, uh, we tend to see um, organizations with different type of experience. Some are some have prior experience, some don't, but they will come together to join this, uh, uh, this disaster relief actions. So you can see the Fiji cyclone, we see more um, evidence of resourcefulness because we see the diverse composition of uh, networks for this uh, disaster relief. But for Ecuador, for all, all kinds of dimensions, we don't really see a distinct structure. So what is the takeaway from this uh, case, uh, four cases actually? So I think uh, kind of I propose that disaster management they should take into account uh, a different type of factors when they come up with the mechanisms of coordination and collaboration between different type of organizations. Especially they need to consider the organizational factors and the network structures and the envir environmental factors. So you can see the relief organization when they join a relief actions, uh, the way they connect are actually taking different forms. We see there are two types of networks. One is more structured and bureaucratic. So so it's making it very difficult for a new organization to enter, but also at the same time, create liability for existing organizations. So for, um, for the, for the uh, Vanuat, for actually across all the disasters, organizations from the uh, affected regions are more effective, uh, I'm sorry, are more active, but and also those from North America and Europe, they are also very active. So across different disasters, we see this kind of trend. So, um, so um, I think the, the liability for existing organizations is kind of uh, evident. So, uh, so uh, the same organization, they tend to be uh, um, present uh, to, to sh uh, in all type of disasters. So in this uh, network, we see this liability and we also see the, uh, the constraints. But for the other type of network, we see it's more uh, flexible and fluid. Uh, creating more opportunities for new, uh, just for the volunteer groups or citizen-based groups. If they want to join, they probably can choose to uh, join this network as the as the uh, as the starting point. So compared to the uh, with the other three places, Ecuador's um, the the interpretation that I come up with is that Ecuador's their geopolitical location is more unique compared to uh, compared to the other three. Uh, places um, uh, and they have a uh, lower GDP. Uh, Ecuador has a higher GDP. I think that's the reason why we don't really see a clear structure, network structure in Ecuador. Probably because they have the better uh, infrastructure to deal with this type of uh, disaster. So they don't really see a lot of uh, uh, organization coming from outside of the uh, Latin Amer uh, American, uh, American area. So the, the network structure is kind of uh, different from the other three uh, disasters. And uh, I also see the trend where the, uh, there's a disaster-specific network structure. So in the disaster with a longer period of warning, like cyclones, so organizations often comply with the existing structure. We can see the organization, if they occupy the central position in one network, they tend to occupy the central position in another network. So in disaster of this type, uh, organization, they probably will just follow the existing structure. But for the disaster kind of sudden, uh, we can see the structure is likely to be broken. So I think this could kind of uh, give us some uh, some food for thought uh, about like how to collaborate or coordinate in different type of disasters. So uh, I use this uh, as the example to show uh, how the active network resilience could be as the process of network. And for the next, I want to show you how the um, Another example to show how the active network resilience could be as a process of network considering different sites. So we know that when a disaster or emergency happens, uh, people usually resort to voluntary sector. But for voluntary sector, they also need to uh, acquire resources and uh, collaborate with uh, entities from different domains, like uh, from media, from private uh, domain and the governments. So, um, but in the existing research, um, we don't really focusing on different sides of resources acquisition. Or probably we're just focusing on the humanitarian organization, how they provide service. Or on the other side, we're, focus we're focusing on how communities, they receive uh, support from the humanitarian organizations or from the government. But don't really put them together. So the question of the research uh, that I was conducting, looking at the both sides. So I want to know the, how the, uh, on, the, on the one side, the network of resource provision, which is uh, humanitarian organizations, how they provide uh, resources to the affected organization, uh, to the affected communities. And on the other side, 
how the affected communities actually receive different type of resources from the humanitarian organizations or from the government or from different type of entities. How these two networks, they co-evolve uh, in different phases of uh, disasters. So I want to know how uh, in this process, how the resilience is enacted, is manifested. So I uh, look at the case, of, uh, it actually happened uh, five years ago in, in Taiwan, Kaohsiung. Uh, Kaohsiung is, a popul is one of the big uh, metropolitan areas in Taiwan. It's probably not as dense as uh, Hong Kong, but it's also, it's, it's also a big city in Taiwan. And uh, five years ago, it was a big uh, gas explosions that affected um, more than two, uh, 20 neighborhoods in the Kaohsiung area and uh, caused um, 31 deaths and more than 300 uh, injured. So at that time, uh, I con conducted uh, interviews with uh, 90 com 19 communities. I also had a survey with uh, 27 humanitarian organizations and private organizations, private um, companies, and uh, government institutes. So I um, want to know how they provide resources at the same time receive resources. So uh, the findings uh, shows that uh, for on the relief organizational side, uh, the, those resource provision networks uh, at the consecutive time points significantly are relate to one another. What does that mean? That means that those humanitarian organizations, uh, they kind of learn and maintain their ways of uh, providing resources to the affected communities. So um, that's why the network structure from the earlier time predict the network structure at a later time. So that's the implication we can see from this finding. So they maintain and learn their ways of providing resources to the affected communities. And then I see that um, re those response organizations, they also receive uh, uh, resources from the affected communities. That's kind of uh, uh, beyond our, or kind of surprising um, to, to me is that um, because we see response organizations, they are supposed to provide resources. How, how, how is it possible that they need to have the resources or acquire resources from the affected communities, but they did. So in this case, uh, I saw that response organizations, they actually receive resources from the entities in the affected area. So there must be some private uh, companies they were not affected seriously by the incident. So they were able to provide accommodation or provide some information uh, uh, to the response organization. So they know how to uh, better um, uh, handle or uh, deal with the situation in the local area. So I found that if the response organization, they receive more resources from the entities in the affected area, they tend to provide more resources to the affected uh, uh, communities in the, in the same time. So you see there's a mutual resource mobilization be, uh, between response organizations and affected communities. But this effect or this pattern disappeared two months after the incident. So what does it mean? That means on the one hand, those response organizations, they probably already uh, um, they, I think they, will, they probably find it sufficient to use the resources they have accumulated over the uh, earlier phases of disaster relief. So they, they, don't, they don't need to re acquire re new resources from the affected uh, um, areas. So uh, we don't really see this kind of mutual resource mobilization two months after the incident. And uh, the other thing is that, see, after this incident, there is an emergent response uh, community that kind of uh, um, uh, uh, the, or that was detected. So two months after the incident, this uh, trend, uh, tr temporary response community kind of uh, um, um, transform into a latent base of uh, um, response uh, network. So uh, the organization res resumed their operations. They no longer actually have an uh, intense interaction with uh, affected communities. So I see uh, this is uh, the kind of timeline. You see the response organization, they got involved, but two months after, uh, they kind of disappeared. But uh, we see that uh, because of the limited uh, scope of this incident, so I think two months probably will be the kind of re uh, reasonable timeline. Uh, but before the longer or larger uh, disasters, probably the timeline will be uh, longer. Uh, 
So this from the relief organizational side, we see the uh, particular network structure and the mutual resource mobilization between them and the affected communities. But for the affected community side, we see the similar uh, network structure uh, that the earlier network predict the later uh, networks. So what does that mean? That means that these affected communities, they, their resource relationships are quite consistent over time. But that also gives us a lesson where that if the, if the communities, they are getting more resources early on, they are getting more resources later on. If they are getting less resources, they are getting less resources later on. So this kind of inequity is reinforced uh, in this case. So that's kind of the finding of uh, this network structure predicting later one could give us. And then uh, I see the network structure uh, where the centralization, what is centralization? That means there are certain affected communities that get more resources from different types of uh, entities. So that one means by centralization. I see this centralization actually quite evident in the first four uh, months. So there are certain uh, affected communities that get more resources from uh, different types of entities. But this effect disappeared after the first four months. So in the past, uh, in, the lot, in the later eight months, I didn't see this centralization uh, pattern. So what does that mean? That means that these affected communities, they probably find their ways of resuming operations and uh, engaging in their way of uh, rebuilding, uh, uh, rebuilding after the disaster. So that's uh, the, uh, the finding we can see from the, uh, the network structure pattern. So uh, this, uh, the previously I talked about the, how the response organization provide resources to the affected communities. And this is another type of network structure visualization you can see. So the red, uh, the red dots, are the type of organizations that provide resources to the affected communities. And the blue circle, uh, blue squares, are the type of resources that are um, provided, uh, to, uh, to provided to the community. So you can see in the first four months, from the community's perspective, they see there's a big cluster there. So different type of uh, organization, they tend to provide similar resources. So in this case, that, that blue circle, I'm, so, I'm sorry, blue square, is information. So in the first four months, the different type of organization, they tend to provide a similar type of resources, in this case, information. But for the first, uh, the second and the third uh, four months after the incident, a different type of structure emerged. So for in this case, um, this organization, uh, on, the, on the left side, these are the local uh, government agencies and mass media. And the bottom is the nonprofit organizations outside of the area. So it means that those organizations stay to help those communities to recover, and they tend to provide the resources uh, th that are very different from the first four months. In, this, uh, in, the, light, in the later eight months, the resources they provide include emotional support, uh, materials, and the financial resources, because uh, for this gas incident, a lot of residents, they need to claim uh, um, the insurance, and they have the difficulties uh, doing the insurance claims. So in these um, later eight months, they focusing on providing emotional support, materials, and financial uh, resources. So this takeaway uh, is that uh, if we apply this into the disaster management, we will know when to provide uh, resources to affected communities and when to curtail resource provision. As you can see, at different time points, uh, organizations already left and the affected uh, communities, they don't really need uh, the resources. Uh, they can just probably uh, rely on their own. So we need to know the time point, when to provide and when to uh, curtail, or when to provide different type of resources. And we also need to pay attention to the social foundation that is built by the relief organization during the disaster, because uh, some organizations, they do stay. So for those organizations who stay, they actually build these uh, connections. So actually, after this gas explosion, there was another incident in Taipei. So those organizations, they actually reactivate their ties to help uh, respond to that uh, uh, incident in Taipei. So I think we need to pay attention to this uh, foundation that is built during the disaster. And the last thing we need to recognize the social foundation, especially the unequal social foundation that's built by affected communities before and during disaster, because that shows us the very capacity of rebuilding and recovering after the disaster. So uh, the previous two cases, I, I want to illustrate the, the uh, resilience as the as a process. But unless the last one I want to illustrate the case where the resilience could be the outcome of networks. So it's a kind of brief um, case. So um, 
because I'm now looking at the how social media could be used uh, for humanitarian organizations, especially in the context of disaster risk reduction. So uh, for the for this case, I want to look. I want to focusing on the how the resource network of relief organization on the ground could be related to their to their collaboration networks on Twitter. So, and what are the consequences that result from these sustained collaborative uh, humanitarian networks online and offline? So for this one, I chose the Typhoon Haiyan. It happened uh, six years ago in the Philippines. So I had two data, data sets. One is on the resource networks of 41 organizations on the ground. And look, I look at how they get resources from different types of entities. And then the other data set is uh, on those same organizations, how they collaborate with each other on Twitter. So the findings uh, show that um, um, even after several months, uh, there is a cross section. I just use this visualization. So this is the immediate after the storm. So the blue squares are the uh, organization that provide resources to the uh, response organizations. So the, these are blue uh, squares, and the red. The red dots are the type of organization that I interviewed. So you can see this on the, on the top, this is in the immediate after the storm. There is a very clear evidence of cross-sector and cross-geographical uh, collaboration uh, on the ground, this immediate after the storm. And this one is within three months following the storm. Even though the network is kind of uh, less dense, but this pattern of cross-sector and cross-geographic collaboration is still strong. So this kind of give us the evidence of the, the resilience as the outcome of sustained collaborative networks on the ground. And for this one is on Twitter. So on the left, that's one month before typhoon. And this, the middle one is two weeks after typhoon. And on the right is two months after typhoon. You can see, uh, okay, so the each red, uh, blue dots are the organization, uh, humanitarian organization that uh, got involved in this uh, humanitarian uh, uh, relief efforts for typhoon. So you can see two weeks after typhoon, the network's very dense. So, and the, the, this, the word clouds refer to the topics that bring them together. They use, I use the hashtag. So uh, to analyze the, the, if they have the same hashtag, they have the connection. So you can see in the, mid, in the middle, right after the uh, typhoon, the network is very dense and all the topics are about uh, the, the disaster, the typhoon disaster. And even before and after, the network is not that dense, but they are connected uh, by other topics related to the different type of humanitarian efforts. So I see this is kind of sustained uh, collaborative networks on Twitter, online. Uh, it's another evidence that showing that uh, actually when uh, there's after the typhoon, uh, there's another like different type of disasters, but they can use this uh, social foundation built online to help them react, to find potential collaborators uh, to prepare to respond for another disaster. So that's kind of a giveaway, a takeaway that uh, get out of these uh, uh, findings. So uh, most important thing from this study is that uh, we, I find that cross-sector collaboration between the public, nonprofit, and private uh, organizations is an optimal way of helping communities to deal with hazards. You can see uh, even uh, three months after the disaster, the, this pattern of cross-sector collaboration is still going strong. And then we need to pay attention to the emergent, robust ways of communication. So in this case, uh, they can use a Twitter, particular uh, hashtags, to help them maintain this uh, robust way of communication and the collaboration. So whenever there's a need to reactivate the ties, they can easily do that to find the, uh, uh, um, the, um, the appropriate uh, partners uh, for relief operations. So I think this is the kind of thing that kind of goes on and on in my different studies about this uh, uh, latent uh, network of risk, disaster risk reduction because after all, it's a long-term uh, solution for collaboration among different type of organizations. So uh, kind of a conclusion um, that I use these different uh, cases to illustrate the concept of activated network resilience. I know it's a kind of academic uh, scholarly concept, but I hope that could can bring more dialogue and discussion about how it could apply to the practical um, uh, solutions on, on for the humanitarian sectors. So thank you again for um, your attention. So I look forward for more discussion. Thank you.